Hi. Um, so, yeah, as I already said, I'm going to be talking about cookie cutter today. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today. That's the first Pi data for me, actually. Uh, and I'm really surprised, or like not surprised, but very happy with how it's been so far. Um, so thank you very much to all the organizers. It's a great event. Just a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Raphael, and I'm currently based in Berlin. I have lived in Edinburgh and Scotland for the past one and a half years, um, but I'm German originally. So if you're interested in Scotland, you can talk to me afterwards. I'm a maintainer and core developer of the Cookie Cutter project. I also contribute to PyTest and plugins and everything around that. And sometimes I act a bit as a community person, so I talk on podcasts or I lead the development sprints at Europath, for instance. I'm also the creator of the template, the Cookie Cutter PyTest plugin, um, and we'll talk about that later on. And as my day job is a software engineer at a company called Movil. We work in the field of urban mobility and I use Python and Go. Um, so if any of that is interesting to you, you can find me afterwards where we can talk. I'm also on social media. Hackerbroad is my Twitter handle and my GitHub username. I'll post links to my slides later on on my Twitter. And the agenda for today, so first of all, I want to talk about what Cookie Cutter actually is. And second, I want to kind of show you and explain to you um, how Cookie Cutter works. Then we'll have a brief look into how you can create your own templates. So if you um, have maybe best practices in your team at work or in your open source project, it might be a good idea to create a template from that and build all new projects based on that template. And then we'll have a look at some popular cookie cutter templates and they vary quite a bit in the scope. So some of them are really minimal. They only get you started, but there are also templates which uh, kind of bootstrap your entire web application. And I think that's really powerful. So we'll have a look at that. And then in the end, um, there will be a short demonstration of how you actually use Cookie Cutter. And since we are at PyData, there is a great template for creating custom Jupyter widget. Um, so I'll demonstrate how that works. So what is Cookie Cutter? That's, first of all, is our amazing logo. I think that's uh, worth showing. <laughs> um, we can find us on GitHub. Um, it's hosted under Audrey's user handle. That's Audrey R slash cookie cutter. Uh, you might know Audrey from, um, she's one of the authors of the Two Scoops of Django book series. And uh, Audrey and her husband, uh, Danny, Daniel, uh, they worked on the project originally, but they're still maintainers of the project. And this is how Cookie Cutter works. You, you, usually you use the command line interface and then you just run the executable and then you specify a template that you want to use to generate a new project. We support a number of abbreviations. Um, so in that case, you can see we reference GitHub and then we say from the PyTest dev organization, we want to use the Cookie Cutter PyTest plugin um, template. And then once Cookie Cutter clones the repository for you, it will ask you for input. So it prompts you like one after another. First, it asks me for my full name, and then in the square brackets, you can see that's the default value. So when I hit return, it will just use the default. Uh, but you are also free to provide your own values, um, as you can see with the blue font size on the right-hand side. So for instance, the plugin name, the default would be foobar, but I decided to use emoji instead. Um, and in the end, the three lines, that's log output from hooks. So there is a mechanism that uh, allows you to, as a template author, to run arbitrary code in Python or a bash script before you generate the project and then also once the project is generated. Um, and that comes in really handy sometimes. And then if everything is successful, you will have this um, directory structure um, for this particular template. And you can see um, we provided this name of emoji and you can find it in the root directory. There's also a Python script, PyTest emoji. And there's also a test, test emoji. So you can already figure that, well, Cookie Cutter does something with your input and um, creates files and directories based on that. As already mentioned, we're on GitHub. You can find the documentation on read the docs. And we are also on the Python packaging index under Cookie Cutter. Uh, we support all major platforms, so Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and then a whole range of Python versions um, and also PyPy. Um, and the target project, they can be of any arbitrary Python programming language or markup format. So you can still use Cookie Cutter as someone who doesn't use Python, and I think that's really handy. So 
yeah. Um, and this is how you install Cookie Cutter from PyPI, uh, just with pip. But if you're on macOS and you like Homebrew as your package manager, you can use Homebrew. Uh, so brew install Cookie Cutter. There's also uh, something set up for the Linux users among us. Um, or if you use Conda, there's also Cookie Cutter on the Conda Forge. There's a quite a large community by now, and it's published and distributed under a permissive BSD3 license, so you can even build projects on top of the project. Um, I think that's really helpful. And there are, by now, there are among around like 160 individual contributors from around the world, and there are more than a thousand templates on GitHub already. So I think the chances of finding something that goes into the direction that you want to uh, create a project for, I think, is, is there. You can also contribute, we have a chat, um, and everyone is invited to contribute, so if you're interested or you have questions, just find me afterwards and, and we can talk and I can try to help you get started contributing. So how does it work? So first of all, there are two things to mention here. So you can use either the command line interface, as we saw earlier, or you can import cookie cutter and use kind of the engine from your Python script, so you don't need to use the command line if you don't want to. There are a number of options to, for instance, change the level of verbosity, but you can also suppress the prompting altogether and provide all the values by yourself from the Python API, for instance. That's the command line interface. So as we saw already, you use the executable, then you provide a number of options if you want to, then the template, and there's something called the extra context. And what it does, can we can look at an example here. Um, so we enable the verbose mode and we say we don't want to prompt the user for input, so we use the no, no, uh, no input flag here. Then we say we want to use the PyTest plugin template, and then that's the extra context. So we know that there is a variable called license, and we already choose that we want to use a BSD3 license. The default is the MIT, I think, for the template. And then we also say we want to use documentation and generate that with uh, Sphinx. So that's kind of the extra context. It's a way of overwriting the defaults and then not prompting. So I think that's a nice way of um, not having to prompt the user for input. From the Python API, API you just import cookie cutter from the main module, um, pass a template to it, um, and, and that's it, pretty much. So how does it work? So behind the scenes, there is on the front, there is click, what we use for the prompting, but in the back, there is Jinja. Um, and Jinja is a project, and that's a templating engine that is modeled after the one from Django. So if you use templating in web projects, you might know them. Uh, Jinja is also in, in Flask, for instance. And it's really, really powerful, and that's why I decided to use that. So whenever you see something with those curly braces, um, that's some, for you an indicator that there is something happening with some templates uh, magic. Um, um, so in the first case, you can see, uh, so that's just some Python script, and you can see there is the curly brace, curly brace, cookie cutter dot plugin name, so we reference a variable called plugin name here, and then there's also for the keyboard argument of default, there is some extra magic here, which is a function call, and we'll look into that just in a bit. You can also use filters, which is really powerful. Yeah. So as you can see here in the line with the module name, we reference the plugin name, but then we apply a lower filter to it, so we make sure that the value is all lowercase, all characters are lowercase, and then we replace every hyphen with an underscore. So you can kind of chain together all your filters um, and use one output for the input of the next one. We support uh, different version control systems, so you can use a remote template or you can use a local template, and for remotes, we support Git and Mercurial, and there's currently an open pull request by Russell, Russell Keith McGee to support uh, zip files, so you can provide an URL to a zip archive and we'll download that, extract it, and use the template that's included in there. But that's not merged or released yet, but we're working on that. So how do you create your own cookie cutter template? So first of all, there are two things to mention here. You need a directory that needs to follow this uh, templating syntax, so it needs to be templated, and then you need a file called cookiecutter.json. So when we start, create a new directory for our project, and then we create this templated uh, root directory for the generated project, we use the syntax here to say that the name of our root directory for the generated project should be the value of project slug. 
So that's something that the user would enter. Uh, in the case that I showed earlier, that would be the emoji thing, for instance. Then if we go into that directory, um, we, from this project slug, and you can see that we also have this uh, cookie cutter dot something, so that's kind of the namespace that we always have to use. And then you kind of need to know that whatever you register or use as a variable, you need to register that in the cookie cutter JSON context file. So that's like those two ways. First, the directory, and then you have the, the directory, and then you have the cookie cutter JSON. So then if you, for instance, want to create a Python script, um, you use a new variable name called script name um, and use the file extension for a Python file here and put in this content. So we define a function called hello pydata and then we just print hello pydata and then the value of the location variable. So we used um, three variables essentially and we need to register them in this context. So we go to the directory of our template project and create this. And that's all you need to put in there. So all the variables that we use throughout our template need to be registered here and provided with a default. So project slug, just project for instance, location world, and the script name, we can use a template uh, syntax already in the cookie cutter JSON. So that's how you, for instance, lowercase something to be compliant with PEP8 in your Python projects. So that's the whole template. That's all you need to have a very, very minimal cookie cutter project. And then if you run that, um, you can use a local path as well. It will ask you, please provide a project log. The default is project, and we say, hello project. Location, the default is world, but we decide to use Berlin instead. And then in the script name, you can already see that this templating works interactively. So from the last question, it knows that our location is not world, but Berlin, and it changed um, the default for script name to accommodate for that. So then, if it's run successful, uh, that's the generated project for us. And if we run that, you can see it prints out hello pie data and then the location variable value. I think that's pretty cool. So about Ginger, um, whenever you see those curly braces, you already know there's something going on with Ginger. And that's essentially just three things to keep in mind. Whenever you see something with curly braces and percentage, you know it's a statement. So there is some kind of function, some kind of logic that's being executed. If you see something with two curly braces, that's always the value for the template variable. So that's just the, the string kind of that's inserted there. And then you can also have comments in your Jinja templates which will not be included in the rendered um, output for your template. So what's really handy, I think, are the control structures in Jinja. So you can, for instance, have a for loop in your template, and you probably know that from when you're working with web apps, for instance, you iterate over some sort of data, and for all of the data, you create a new row in your HTML table or something. Uh, you can also have if statements, so you can decide based on the user input if you want to do something or something else. And you can also use macros. Um, and macros are kind of a way of how you can put some logic, some template logic, and define it in a macro, and then import it and reuse that throughout your template. So you don't need to repeat the template logic everywhere. And in that particular case, for this example, uh, I'm using a restructured text here for my readme file. But you know, when you define a heading in a restructured text file, you have the text, and then you need to have a second line, and then put as much, many equal signs in the next line as you would have characters on the first line. And that's how you define a heading in a restructured text format. I think that's really tedious if you need to do that by hand every time. So it's, it's a nice way of defining a macro, and it will just copy the, the value and replace all of the characters with an equal sign. So that's how you would, for instance, use a heading in a restructured text. There are also certain control structures which kind of help you to um, create more powerful templates. Uh, you can use assignments, so your template can have its own local variables. You can also use includes, and what that is, it is, I think, best shown here in an example. That would be a license file for the generated project. So rather than having just one license in my templates, I like to kind of give my users the option of choosing from a set of different licenses for the open source projects. 
But then rather than copying all of the license texts into this one single file and making it super hard to maintain, I have this logic in here um, that references the folder. So you can see there is an include and then it takes MIT, for instance, from this license directory. So when the user decides, hey, I want to use the MIT license, my template will include the rendered template from, from well, the template for the MIT license text. I think that's really good. There are also filters, and we already had a look at that, so you can have a replace, a lower, an upper, and there's so many built-on filters already. Um, I think we, we've talked about this before. Um, there are also more powerful ones, so you can sort, for instance, you can sort a sequence of items, uh, and even like based on an attribute, so if you have a structure, I don't know, some object, and it has an attribute, you can sort by that, and then do something with your template in there. You have also select and group by, and I think you kind of get the idea. You can use different filters for different things, and uh, I think it's best to look at the, the gender 2 documentation. Uh, that's a really good point where you can get started looking into this. There are also extensions. So if you have the same template logic and repeat it all over again, it makes sense to encapsulate that, put it into an extension, and maybe even publish that on PyPI. Um, and in this particular case, in Cookie Cutter, we have one extension called Ginger Time, because users oftentimes are prompted for the current year. And that feels, as a user, feels kind of ridiculous. Like, why do you need to put in the current year here? So we decided to write an extension for that. Um, and for instance, in the MIT license text, um, there is a requirement that you kind of, when you say who's the copyright holder, you have the current year, and then you have the, the author's name. So that's how you would do that with cookie cutter and ginger. So you can see there is this now function that comes with the extension. Uh, you say from the UTC time zone, and then some uh, uh, Python string uh, format for outputting the year. So just to mention a couple of popular cookie cut up templates so you can maybe have a look at them later on. There is one for Python packages. So with that template, you can create a new Python project that already follows the best practices for Python projects that you then later can upload to PyPI. So it has a setup, PY setup. It has a manifest EN setup and all of that stuff. You have also testing. You can choose from either unit test or PyTest. You can also have talks. It's another testing project with which you can uh, test your code against different Python versions, and it has things for documentation. Then there's also Cookie Cutter Django, which is from Daniel. Um, and this is one of the ones where you have so many different features, and you get this like the whole web application bootstrapped. Um, they have um, an optimized development and production settings, so that's really nice. They have debugging setup and metrics and all of that. They have Docker support, Bootstrap, um, and a sheer endless list of features. So you should definitely have a look at that if you want to see how kind of how complex a template can be. Then there's also this very minimal one where you can use this template to create a PyTest plugin. So there is a convention when you want to create your PyTest plugin how you need to set up the setup tools entry points so that PyTest will understand that, hey, this is a PyTest plugin, and we're registered properly, and all of that stuff. And the template takes care of that. It also has a couple of examples for fixtures and command line options and all of that stuff. And as I mentioned, you can choose from different uh, licenses, open source licenses. And then if you're interested, for instance, in building a Python app for an iOS device, um, the Awesome people from the PyBeware project, they have a template here, a PyTest iOS template, with which you can create a Python project that runs your app on iOS, which is kind of nice. And it works well with the Toga toolkit, which is also under the PyBeware umbrella. So now for just a very quick demo, how you would use Cookie Cutter to create a custom Jupyter uh, widget. That's the template that I use. I kind of forked it, made some changes to include emoji because because emoji are awesome. Uh, so just look at that. So the first thing that we, that we do is we say we want to use cookie cutter um, and say, please um, use the widget cookie cutter. Um, there's also a feature in cookie cutter with which you can uh, check out a branch. So you can say, please take the emoji branch and then GitHub, for instance, then my username, and then I say, widget uh, cookie cutter. 
and then it will ask me if I want to clone that again, because I've done that already. Then it asks me for my author name, um, and there is also a feature called user config. So in my home directory, I have this cookie cutter RC file, uh, in which I register certain variables to some default values. So the original template has a, def a different author name, but in that particular case, it picks whatever I have in my user config. Um, and I'm happy with that. The GitHub project name, I'll just say emoji widget, GitHub username, that's okay. Uh, Python package name, uh, npm, an awesome emoji widget. Oops, emoji widget. And then it asked me for a default emoji, and that's really just for the sake of uh, the presentation here. I'm going with coffee, because coffee is good. Um, and then I have a virtual environment set up here. I go into the generated project, and uh, the template has an install script here. Uh, it installs Jupyter, it installs my widget project, um, and then what it does, it uses the Jupyter um, API to register my extension. So everything is nice here. And then if I run a Jupyter notebook, can I see that okay? Cool. So creating a new Python 3 notebook and then from emoji, oops, import hello world, and then I'm creating a new widget, and then I'm displaying that. And it says, hi, I'm Rafael Piazina, so that's the author name that we provided in the template, and then it uses coffee, which was one of the options that we defined in the input as well. And just to demonstrate that you can also do something differently here, uh, hello world, and we say uh, text, nope, emoji, uh, I don't know, angry. And then it says, hey, sorry, this emoji is not supported. Yeah. So this, I think, kind of gives you an impression of how you would use Cookie Cutter to generate a new project, and the project just works, kind of. I think that's really nice. Okay, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I also wanted to draw your attention to the, we have a kind of, not a fundraiser, but uh, since Cookie Cutter development is entirely run on volunteers' time, um, we kind of decided to create a Patreon page. So if you're interested in supporting our project because you or your company are using Cookie Cutter already as part of your development process, um, please check out the site. And if you have any questions, talk to me afterwards. That's me on Twitter and GitHub, and I would be happy to take any questions if you have any. How do you um, develop the templates? So I think like there is no certain way of how everyone does it. What I usually do is, because I like to test my code, is write working code first, and then kind of do a global search and replace. So for instance, I develop a new PyTest plugin, and I want to create a template out of that. I would first develop all of the plugin logic and then always use the same string that I can easily then uh, globally search and replace with the cookie cutter variable template. That might become very tedious. Well, yeah, it depends, right? I mean, depending on how you prepare the... Uh, yeah, I mean, there is... I think that's the best way of how you could do that. Um, and, and following on that, so how do you then uh, test the cookie cutter template code on a um, uh, continuous integration platform. Yeah, so <laughs> now it's getting funky. I like to combine thing things. So I wrote a PyTest plugin to create, uh, sorry, to test cookie cutter templates. 
and that's called PyTest cookies. So, so you would use PyTest to use the Python API of Cookie Cutter, and then this plugin provides some kind of nice API to see if there was an error during generation and also to influence the input of the user to replicate that. Okay, and one completely different question about licenses. Yeah. Um, we already saw that those options with MIT starting and going to GPL and yep. um, propriety, but it seems that most projects don't realize that they're doing big mistakes because they license their projects, their templates under like BSD, but they give the option to do MIT, but this is not really applicable. You understand what I mean? Um, not quite. I think the cookie cut, yeah, well, well, it's not really your problem, but it's yeah. it's getting enhanced. Like the uh, Django cookie cutter Django is licensed under M, uh, under BSD, uh -huh. but you get the question if you want to license your project, you create with the t templating thing yeah. um, under MIT. But this is not you essentially couldn't do it. They couldn't allow that. But they I do. think those are two different things, right? So the f the one is like the logic that you get from the template, which Maybe you use the MIT license for that. But then the question that you get while prompting is kind of what license do you want to use for the generated project? And the generated project doesn't have any kind of back references to the template. Does that make sense? I understand it, but I okay. think it's just not, you, you, it couldn't be done. Like you can't license the code differently then later on. It would have had to be MIT in the first place. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about that uh, on the hallway later on. What do you think is the greatest advantage of cookie cutter in comparison to other uh, code generation tools? Um, so I've been asked at previous conferences if I use uh, Yoman, which is part of the JavaScript uh, community. Uh, and I think there, are so, there is a list of different code generation tools. Um, the reason I use Cookie Cutter is because I, I don't know, I stumbled across this and I like the project and the authors. Uh, I like it because it's written in Python and it's fairly easy, I think. Um, there is no company behind it, which has its good sides, but also we don't have any funding, so that's bad. Um, as a user, I would say, why would you use cookie cutter over something else? The biggest advantage for me is because it's using Jinja. So if you already work with Python, you are familiar maybe with the Django templating engine, or if you use Slask, you already know Jinja. So the only thing that you really need to know, like if you want to get started with cookie cutter, is how you use it. But the underlying templating might already be familiar to you as a Python engineer, I think. I think that's pretty cool. Any other questions? Cool, thank you.